Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Megan Anderson, and I'm your Extension Field Agronomist um, in Central Iowa. I serve nine counties here, and I've worked for Iowa State for about eight years. Uh, but my background is in uh, specifically uh, weed suppression with cover crops. Um, so uh, I always get excited when I get to come have discussions about those topics. Uh, so really three things I want to talk about today, and then you know, feel free to take any notes you want, but I do have this resource sitting over on the table next to that nice little uh, trifold thing uh, that really has a summary of everything I'm going to talk about and then a little bit more uh, that I won't be able to cover today, which is about um, residual herbicides. I don't think I'll discuss that. Um, so terminating cover crops successfully. So no matter what timing we opt to terminate our cover crops, we want to make sure that we're doing it well. Right, so Iowa State's recommendations still remain that a head of corn, we would really like a cover crop uh, to either be winter killed or terminated 10 to 14 days prior to planting that corn. Um, it's not so much the timing in my mind, it's more I would like that cover crop to be brown and dead when I'm planting corn into it. We can certainly get away with shorter timelines with that in specific situations and in certain springs, uh, but that's never a way that I would want somebody to start out their experience managing a cover crop ahead of corn. We wanna make sure that that's dead when we're planting corn, at least to start with. You can get creative afterward if you're interested in that. Ahead of soybeans, that timing is going to be much less specific, uh, right? If someone is comfortable with it, you could terminate all the way up until just ahead of crop emergence. Uh, but again, we do want that cover crop to be dead in most cases before that soybean is going to be out of the ground. And especially for those of us who are just getting started with cover crops, the earlier we get this uh, cover crop terminated, uh, the more protective that is toward our seasonal crop that we're actually making money off of. And so our goals of herbicide termination, no matter what timing we choose uh, to do that termination, is we want an effective kill so that we avoid complications with the seasonal crop, whether that be uh, actually suppressing the crop like we could see with corn, whether it be a disease issue or an insect issue that could be associated with like a green bridge effect from that cover crop. Uh, we wanna make sure we're picking the right herbicide and the right tank mix partners, the right adjuvants uh, for the species that we have out in that field. That may include both the cover crop and whatever weeds are out there. Um, and then we wanna make sure that we can maximize efficiency Right, just like we all want to do. I don't want to make any more passes across the field than I have to to get a cover crop killed. So let's see what we can do to include other things in the tank, if possible and if reasonable, uh, to make sure that we can get multiple things done perhaps in one pass. And so your termination success depends on tons of different factors. Uh, herbicides are by far going to be the most common termination method. If anyone has questions about other methods, we could certainly talk about them. Uh, but we want to be thinking about how big the cover crop is, uh, what the weather conditions are like, um, the, herb the rate spray technique we're using, uh, other important things that we might want to think about uh, when we're choosing specific herbicides is what the crop is that's going to be planted next uh, and what other weed species are present in the field, right? If I have a grass cover crop, but I have a whole bunch of mare's tail or some other broadleaf, then I'm going to want to include something that will be very effective on those broadleafs, maybe more so than something like glyphosate. Uh, and so for grasses, uh, glyphosate remains by far the most effective option. There's really been a, quite a substantial amount of research into this. A lot of people interested in alternative options for herbicide termination, but glyphosate is gonna be our most effective option for our crops like our cereal rye. If we do have something out there like a red clover um, or a vetch or broadleaf weeds, we want to consider using something like a 2,4-D or a dicamba in with that probably uh, to be more effective on those species. Um, we do have some other options. I've got gramoxone listed here. I have uh, glufosinate or Liberty listed. Other people have looked into using group one herbicides like our clethodims um, or fluazifop type products. And those are just by far not nearly as consistent uh, and typically not nearly as effective as glyphosate is going to be on a kind of broad range basis. 
And so just to emphasize that, I've got a couple graphs here. Um, these are from uh, the University of Missouri, but this is a multi-state, so it was a five-state research study where they looked at uh, gramoxone mixes, so paraquat mixes, they looked at glufosinate or Liberty mixes, and they looked at glyphosate mixes to try and control, in this case, cereal rye. Um, and you can see that those, all of the Liberty, the glufosinate mixes were pretty poor in their consistency. And so these box plots basically show you uh, where uh, the 25th to 75th percentile was for the data. And there's a little black bar in here that shows you what the median, the middle number was for control. And so you can see all of those are really quite poor. Um, in fact, some of them as low as close to 80% control. I would be pretty disappointed with 80% control of that cover crop because that 20% that's left is going to compete with my crop. Um, the uh, paraquat mixes were better. They were more consistent, but they still were not nearly as good as the glyphosate mixes. Those glyphosate mixes, Roundup, was by far the best option. You can see how tiny those boxes are because it was much more consistent in control. Um, if we get in a situation, right, like this spring, it looks like we're starting to warm up. Things are starting to look nicer out there. If we get in a scenario where we are having really bad conditions outside, we can do something like add this, uh, like a clethodim type product in with glyphosate, and that will improve the consistency of control over just a glyphosate by itself. Um, and so there are some things that we can do to even improve the consistency within that, those glyphosate mixes themselves. And so I just wanted uh, to emphasize this point with a few images. I used a small boom. So each one of these plots, we walked down and then we turned around and walked back. So you'll notice in the middle of the plot, I got better kill because I got a double rate of herbicide. Um, so what we're really looking at is sort of this, like the left third and the right third in each of these pictures. And so three weeks after treatment, that was about an eight inch tall cover crop that we sprayed. You can see that both the paraquat and the glufosinate are growing back, and that glyphosate is the only one that's nice and dead. Um, a week after treatment, all of them were pretty yellow, but uh, paraquat and glufosinate looked pretty darn promising. It took me nearly three weeks to see that it was growing back, and then having to go back out and retreat that would be a really disappointing situation. Uh, here's a large cover crop, right? This was probably the better part of three feet tall at the time of application. Uh, same herbicide rates. Um, you could see uh, that they all look fairly brown. <clears throat> this Liberty, I would equate to similar to what I might expect to see from like Clethodim uh, or one of the grass killers if I sprayed a tall cover crop. It's going to have more green in it. And then specifically with Paraquat and Glufosinate both, uh, as well as the Clethodim, that rye is going to stay more upright if we opt to use one of those herbicides to treat uh, this, the cereal rye. Uh, with the glyphosate, you can already see it's really, it's falling down and it will naturally just seem to fall down better on its own because of that more effective kill that we get. Uh, so this is what the untreated look like and then at the time of treatment, you can see what it looked like there. Uh, if we're using legume cover crops, uh, which is not necessarily something that very many people are doing, but I know that there's a lot of interest in incorporating legumes. Um, again, we can kind of see the effectiveness of these different herbicide treatments. We had a lot more effective options on a legume-only treatment, um, but in most cases, the most consistent treatments had 2,4-D or dicamba in them, and in most cases, we're probably not going to have a legume only in Iowa, right? You're prob if you have a legume, it's probably in a mix with a grass, in which case your most effective option is going to be that glyphosate with 2,4-D or dicamba. Um, if we use other things in the mix, we want to uh, make sure that we're aware that they can cause complications, especially if we have uneven sizes in our cover crop. So using UAN like a head of corn uh, to terminate that cover crop can cause uh, termination failures in that you are going to kill things that are really small uh, because that UAN causes a surface burn on them. So if it's very small, it, those plants get overwhelmed and they can't recover from that. But if you have larger plants out there, so specifically I think of situations where we maybe had fall applied anhydrous, right, and that cover crop over those bands of anhydrous grew better, right, it's greener, it's bigger, it took up more of that nitrogen. In those cases, this bigger cover crop, those leaves can get burned and it actually prevents the movement of glyphosate in the plant. 
and can cause incomplete termination. So you could see all these nice big plants. They looked nice and brown at, shortly after application, but they started to come back. Uh, so best management practices to kill cereal rye, because that's our biggest one that we're after in the spring. Glyphosate's the best option. A pound acid equivalent per acre. Make sure we're pre-treating our water with AMS. Uh, we want to make sure that we have an actively growing cover crop. And we are headed for, it looks like, warmer temperatures in the forecast, finally, where we should be able to start seeing some active growth out of these. I like 60 plus degree temperature days. And I really, for several days after your application, don't want it to get below 40, if at all possible. That's going to be the best case scenario to get something killed. But again, glyphosate can cover us in a lot of situations. And a pound acid equivalent per acre is more than you probably really need in good conditions. So that will help protect us in bad conditions as well. Um, and again, just remembering this UAN and residual herbicides, they are useful in those mixes. They can increase risk, specifically if we have a lot of UAN in that tank mix. Residual herbicides maybe are going to leave it greener a little bit longer, but in a lot of cases, they're not going to stop that glyphosate from killing anything. So just a couple minutes here on weed suppression, right? If we let our cover crop grow longer, we have better opportunity to get weed suppression, right? So I've heard people refer to more biomass equals more benefits. Um, and that's, there's a lot of truth to that, right? So ahead of this corn, right, we've got a very small cover crop. But here we have beans planted into a much larger cover crop that's been terminated. They're already emerging out of there. And so biomass is going to be the key to physically suppressing weeds, right? It's going to be far more important, I think, uh, with the weed spectrum that we have here in Iowa than allelopathy. Uh, or any other factor, we need biomass on the ground because it acts like you're thickening up that soil layer, right? So if we're trying to suppress water hemp, which needs sunlight to germinate, right? It relies on sunlight cues. If we add a cover crop on top of that that's going to be an inch thick, it's going to think that water hemp's going to think it's buried an inch deeper in the soil, and so less of it should be coming up. In Iowa, planting date matters in order to get that biomass. This is some research that I did a long time ago now, 2014, 2013, um, looking at October seeded cover crop versus September seeded. This was in a really, really dry fall. Just have to caveat that. Um, but that September seeded stuff, it, by the time of termination on May 5th, it had substantially more biomass than the late seeded did. Um, this was also from my research looking at the effect of these planting dates on the germination timing or the emergence timing of water hemp. And what we saw uh, is that the time to 50% emergence of water hemp, even with a May 5th terminated cover crop, was delayed by about two weeks. Right? That provides our soybean an opportunity to get ahead of that, that weed right, and provide more suppression. It gives us a wider window of opportunity to get those water hemp treated in a timely manner. It's a really cool opportunity, I think, that we have for weed suppression. But the cover crop alone is probably not going to do it in most cases. Um, so this was uh, research out of Missouri where they were looking at the percent control seven weeks after uh, termination of that cover crop. Um, and what you could see here is that across all of these species, the highest they got was about 65% control of water hemp. And then overall weed control was substantially less because we're going to have a lot of weeds that are not going to be well suppressed by water hemp, right? Large seeded species primarily, think giant ragweed, uh, sunflower, velvet leaf, cockleburr, all of those things are not going to be well suppressed by a, a cover crop. So this was some research out of, uh, it was actually out of Georgia, I think, looking at Palmer amaranth control. And this was six weeks after planting their cash crop. And so what you could see here is that the more biomass they had to a point, the more weed control they got, right? 80% weed control in some cases. Um, this was the level, right? Those levels that I showed you that I found in my research with a May 5th uh, termination timing, right? Um, so we were well below that threshold, but we certainly would have gotten some weed suppression if those levels were in this research. Um, they found uh, in another study that uh, the researchers, Mursky et al., that was in the eastern United States, I believe they said about 7,500 pounds of dry biomass uh, per acre, uh, right? So we're talking more than four tons. Um, 
And then there was a review done actually in 2020 uh, by a gal at Iowa State that looked at the whole of all the research that's been done. And she found that you need a little over two tons of biomass per acre or a little over 4,000 pounds per acre to get about 75% control in the form of a reduction in weed biomass. And so that a lot of, there was a lot of modeling going into that, but that was a neat review of a lot of different research that happened. So I think two tons per acre is totally reasonable ahead of soybean here in Iowa. So in summary, terminating an overwintering cover crop is generally not difficult. The weather tries to throw problems in, but glyphosate's very consistent. It's very effective as long as we know how to manage it. Um, it remains the most effective option even with all the research that's been done. Uh, and if your cover crop stand is even, it can act as a short-lived residual herbicide and provide us some weed suppression in the spring, which is a cool thing. All right. That was my review in hopefully 15 minutes or less. I don't know what time it is. All right, any what questions? Do we have time for questions, Wyatt? You're the taskmaster. Not yet. No questions, okay. Uh-oh, see, he's got questions. Oh, he'll, he'll allow it, he's the boss. about terminating so it doesn't affect yield? Yeah. Well, some of these automatic things that you see that you can do Yep. Does that actually kill the buyer or do you need to use a herbicide also? Yeah, so he asked uh, in magazines, you know, he sees people using roller crimpers and does that actually kill the rye or do you need to use a herbicide? Um, generally, it's probably not going to be quite as effective as a glyphosate pass. In a lot of cases, when they're doing a roller crimper, uh, in the research, unless it's organic, they are using a herbicide with that and getting incredibly good control. Roller crimper's super cool because it flattens that cover crop out, right? So you get a nice mat of material on the ground and you don't get all that, you know, broken down rye covering your soybeans or whatever. Um, there are challenges associated with it. So I would say you can, you certainly could use it by itself, absolutely, without a herbicide if you wanted to. Um, maybe like 90, 95% control or something. If it's timed correctly, the challenge is the timing here in Iowa. It's probably gonna be the end of May or early June before you would be able to roller crimp effectively to kill cereal rye because it needs to essentially be at anthesis stage or pollinating. It's gotta be, essentially be ready to shed pollen by the time you would want to do that and have it be super effective. Otherwise, it's gonna try to stand back up. <laughs> 